This is my 2010 GMC Terrain. Uh, it's equipped with the LAF engine that was used from 10 to model year 11 in both the Terrain and the Equinox and has had nothing but issues such as oil consumption, timing chain issues, and all kinds of mechanical rattling. So over time, it took its toll and the engine finally went. I decided to go ahead and change the engine myself with an LAF to LEA engine conversion. Now the engine does come out from up top. You can do this without dropping the cross member. The LEA engine was used in 2012 and newer Equinoxes, Captivas, and Terrains, and is simply a flex fuel version of the old engine. But it has all the technical updates to make it much more reliable. So here's what happened when I pulled my engine out. And uh, unfortunately, these engines are known for all kinds of issues. As soon as I took the valve cover off, I saw that the timing chain guides were broken. Tensioner was loose. And then this is the reason why there was no antifreeze or oil in the car. So if you look at this closely, you can see that the block broke right in the water cooling jacket and coolant went straight into the crankcase. And as you can see, this connecting rod broke, shattered into a million pieces on the bottom of the pan and kicked the rest of the parts out the side of the block. Upon further investigation, to see what happens with these engines, it already had been low on oil and was uh, probably running pretty hot internally. No coolant, and so forth, so here's the old head. And unfortunately, this is what happens to most of these engines. See that? That is a broken valve. An exhaust valve in particular. So what probably happened was the timing chain skipped, broke, piston hit the valve, valve broke, went in, and then subsequently the piston tried to push up against the broken valve, cracked the piston, and then pieces started falling in, breaking the block, breaking the connecting rod which is made out of powdered metal. So they're strong but they're a little fragile, um, especially when you have things flying around in there. So this whole motor unfortunately has definitely seen better days. It only had 110,000 miles on it. For a modern four-cylinder engine, that shouldn't be much. I hate to say it, but if this engine was manufactured by Honda, Toyota, or Nissan, or any other Japanese manufacturer, or some even German ones, it just probably never would have happened. But hey, it is what it is. So that's the reason why we did the engine conversion. The engine is in, and you have to change over the throttle body from the old engine, from the LAF, and then you have to take these three bolts off that hold this fuel pump and end cap assembly. Those three bolts there. And on the end, there's also a cap. I don't know if you can see it from here, because I got stuff here. That end cap has two bolts on it as well. Then, of course, the high pressure pump comes off as well. Um, the sprocket goes on next. So you have to reuse your old LAF intake cam sprocket, variable cam timing and supposedly the actuator as well. But this gray actuator has the same connector and part number as the old one in the car. So I kept this one because it's newer. The other one was also gummed up with stuff. So then I used a 15 16 wrench, uh, which is also 22 millimeters to hold the camshaft in place. If you see, it's got this hex here. And then the instructions say to tighten this torque to yield bolt. And to be honest, you should put a new one in, but I'm gonna reuse the old one. Click it to 20 foot-pounds, okay, got it right there, and then 100 degrees, which is a little bit more than 90. So I'm going to go from here, 12 o'clock to the about 3.30 position, and I'll tighten it down. Now the intake cam is in place, we're going to go ahead and put the valve cover back on. Just make note that there are these gaskets, individual rings that go around the spark plug holes. The actuator, make sure it's all seated. This is still very clean. I literally took it off a few minutes ago, so I feel confident that this is ready to go back on and won't cause any leaks. All right, that's all in place. Get all my bolts, keep them organized. Uh, if you notice, there's an insert. Some of the bolts have the insert, some of them don't. So what I'm gonna do is make sure that the ones that do have it get a bolt with that one on it. The other ones that do have it, we'll get a bolt that doesn't have it, etc. etc. Make 
making sure the harness is out of the way of the valve cover. It cinched these down real quick. Don't go down all the way. This is just a time, a time saving measure. And then do the rest by hand. Factory calls for about 10 foot pounds, but I like to just go a little bit more all around before I start cracking them down so that the valve cover is settled in place. Okay, so the valve cover appears to be pretty much down and in place. I'm gonna start tightening them. Since there aren't many bolts all around here, I may start with the middle ones too, which happen to also hold the coil packs in each. Put the coil packs in, push them into place on top of the spark plugs, just like before. We zip these down. Then I'm going to start in the middle and go by hand. I don't have a torque wrench that measures in inch pounds, but I'm going based on my years of experience. What about 10 foot pounds that feels like. I'm going all around evenly. Just so the valve cover doesn't crack and everything is properly in place. All right, I'll do one more time just to be sure. Starting from here. That one caught a little more. The rest of them feel pretty good, but it's always good to double check your work. Make sure everything is on tight. All right. Next up, plug in the coil packs. Easy. It's going to go on one way. One, two, three, four, two actuators for the camshaft. The purple connector goes to the black one, that's the exhaust cam. And then the gray one goes to the gray one. Boom. sensor, snap, lock connector pushed in. Oh, by the way, these lock connectors are also pretty important. Make sure nothing gets loose underneath here. Took them out before, I forgot to show you, but just want to make sure you see them. Okay. Lower cover. Make sure everything is in place here. Nothing else has been changed. Take the cap off. Align it and then snap this in place. Oh, one more thing. The EVAP source. Plugs right here. Listen for the snap. And that's all in place. Put the cap back on first so everything's aligned and this way you don't get anything in there. And snap this on. Three pins. Air box. Here, put that in place and put it on the valve, bottle body me. Don't forget this hose, this is for the PCB, it goes on top of the fitting on the air filter, I mean the uh, valve cover to the air box here. Two 516 sockets, or rather um, nuts for the clamps. One and two.
logo as well, you should now have no check engine lights because the check engine lights that I had were based on malfunctions with the camshaft being the wrong one for the engine because the LEA camshaft will not work with the LAF computer because the camshaft position sensor, which is down there, you can't see it's disconnected right over there. That tells the computer what condition the camshaft is in, but because it's a different part number, that's the reason why we're having these error codes. So if all goes well, it has cleared them before we started it. There you go. Check engine light is off. That's how you put an LEA motor into an LAF truck from a 2010 to 2011 GMC Terrain or Chevy Equinox. And in the process, you upgrade to the much better engine, which eliminates the timing chain issues, oil consumption issues, ring issues and all the other issues that the 2010s had. So this car has got a new lease on life thanks to the LEA engine swap.